Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. Oh, it's good afternoon. Um, so we're continuing with our lectures on Conservation 102, and this is part of your introduction to water resources management in South Africa. Okay, you remember this figure that I, this picture that I showed you yesterday? Okay, good. Now, yesterday's introduction comes from a new, a new um, a guideline for the implementation or an overview of the National Water Act, which has been added to the Conservation 102 um, platform on Moodle. So what I want you to make sure is that you, you go through the guideline with the lecture or the, the recording of the lecture from yesterday. So if you want to know what I can test you on, you must go through the lecture. Because if you try to read the whole guideline, You'll, you'll just get lost, and you don't need to. So I will only ask you questions that come out of yesterday's lecture. You with me? Okay, so what I want to do today is just go through a very brief summary of what, how this figure summarizes everything that we looked at yesterday. So the important thing is that the National Water Act provides these six criteria or requirements of how we want to contribute towards the management, the use, and protection of water resources in South Africa. This all comes from the National Water Act. And those six topics include, or six components include, water resources should be protected, they should be used, they should be developed, they should be conserved, they should be managed, and they should be controlled. Okay. By doing those things, we want to ensure that we achieve the vision of the Act, which is sustainability, equitable access or allocation of resources to everybody, and the use must be efficient. Who does this? It's the Department of Water and Sanitation. Okay, this is old. This still has the Department of Water Affairs and Forestry. And guys, as of one, two, one and a half months ago, it is no longer the Department of Water and Sanitation. It is the Department of Human Settlement, Water and Sanitation. Okay. How do they implement it? Well, they give the responsibility to catchment management agencies. And our catchment management agency is the Unkamati Usutu Catchment Management Agency. And they have come up with a catchment management strategy, or they have to implement the catchment management strategy for the management of water resources in our water management area. Okay? And we spoke as well about the water management areas. You can see right here on the top. Right hand corner, there's a little green bobble shows you we're referring to a catchment management area. So we look at catchments. Again, what is a catchment? It is that area of land where all the rainfall that falls into that area flows down into the rivers and flows along that system into the sea. Okay, that's its catchment. Why? Because any land use activity that occurs within that area is going to have an impact to contribute towards the impact on the river, the resource flowing down to the sea. Okay. Um, that you may find that you could have these interbasin transfers that transfer water from one catchment management area to another, okay? But each catchment is managed by its own CMA, catchment management um, agency. All right, we spoke about the strategies, the reserve, ecological reserve and basic human needs, allocation systems, strategic use, inter-catchment transfers and international obligations. Those are all different parts of the Act that require that those parts be considered. Okay, then we looked at different components. What I want to do today, because we've gone through that and we went back to the, the guidelines on the Water Act, and part of the guidelines I showed you in terms of this puzzle of how to bring all of these things together to achieve sustainability, to achieve the vision of sustainability, equitability, and the last uh, vision is efficiency, efficient use of resources. We have got these different components. One component is classify the resource, okay? And then actually decide whether we're gonna classify and allocate the resource for high use or a balance between use and protection. So a little bit of use, a little bit of protection or high protection, okay? So we need to decide as a community whether we're going to allocate the use of the resource towards use or protection or somewhere in the middle. Okay, once we've decided that and we classify the resource, we can then come up with resource quality objectives. Okay, and the resource quality objectives are those 
targets, those things that we want to achieve. Now, I'm going to start today on this presentation on RQOs that was done for the Uli Fonts River catchment. And the reason for this presentation is because I need you to understand that these RQOs, <coughs> these resource quality objectives, are the objectives that specify how and what condition the resource must be managed at, or what is the condition of the system that we must achieve when we are managing the resource. Okay. And why do we have these objectives? Because if I provide a series of objectives, guys, you late, eh? What time is it? Ooh, I want to lock the door. How do I lock the door? So what I want to tell, what you guys need to know is that, um, let me just check this recording. Yeah. So what you need to know is that if we set a range of objectives up for each part of the resource, and we actually work towards achieving them through different, various different platforms or, or, or opportunities we have to manage the resource. And we achieve, we achieve the objectives. If we achieve the objectives on a small scale in our area, and we then achieve the objectives on a large scale like the water management area, and all the objectives on the water management area within South Africa are achieved, then South Africa can achieve the sustainable development goals. You understand that? So the sustainable development goals, remember from the first video you watched, are goals that the world has chosen, has decided, are going to be the targets that we need to achieve to change the way we are using the world so that it can be sustainable. If the world does not achieve sustainable development goals, we are in trouble because we are running out of resources quickly. Okay? And we're going to have lots of problems. Guys, 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 you are very late. Hey? Come on, come on, come on. Okay, so, do you understand the relationship? That if we establish objectives through this process on a fine scale, we can then report on the sustainable development goals and the sustainable management of water resources on large scales. Okay, so all of these introductions are all there to help us understand how do we actually do this. The point of these objectives and the point of all these lectures are here to help you understand how do we actually achieve the sustainable balance between the use and protection of resources. Okay, this is a diagram, a flow diagram, of how the resource directed measures process operates within the, the Department of Water and Sanitation. Okay, this diagram. So, Again, this is a little bit of a summary of what we've looked at already, but this is a very useful flow diagram, hey? And guys, this presentation has already been saved onto your Moodle platform, and um, it's very important. This diagram is very important. This diagram is very important. So what we have is in order to go from having a vision for the resource on the one hand, we all have a vision. We know what we want to achieve. All the way through to actually implementing the vision and monitoring the vision, we have to go through certain procedures, through certain steps. It's like saying, you guys are here today in Conservation 102, but this is not the point, this is not what you guys are aiming at. This is the steps that you are taking so that you can one day get a job in the industry, so that the job can provide for you, so that you can contribute to the management of resources, so that the job can pay you, so you can look after your family. Ladies, you're very, very late, eh? Okay, guys, I cannot lock this venue, but tomorrow's venue I can lock. Okay, I'm serious, guys. Other venues I can lock. So what are we trying to achieve here? We're trying to show you how to go from where we are with wanting, having a vision for the resource. We want to protect these things. We want that balance to be right. Okay? And it's quite serious, guys, because if we don't get this balance right and we use it excessively, it's not going to be there. And unemployment is going to increase. Poverty is going to increase. Hunger and water stress is going to increase. Service delivery is going to decrease. It's going to get worse. And it's going to get worse as the population and the demand for resources increases. Okay? And I can promise you guys that more wars, more war in, wars in the world have been caused by lack of resources than anything else. Do you know that? People fight over resources. 
The whole South Sudan Sudan conflict is there because of the fight for the Nile. Egypt is declaring war today. Egypt is threatening Ethiopia because Ethiopia are building a dam. Do you understand what I'm saying? If the rest of the world, think of Asia, think of India, they have got over a billion people living in their countries alone. They look at Africa and they go, oh, Africa's got lots of resources and they're not doing anything with it. We have a billion people. They only have 58, 58 million people. We can easily take over and use their resources for ourselves. Guys, that's how the world used to work. And I'm telling you that the only reason, if, if we get to a point where the lives of many nations are being threatened because of resource availability, and someone next door has got all these resources available, and they're not doing anything with them, what would you do? They will take them. Do you understand that? This is very serious. So we try to show you how we go from making sure that we have resources, making sure that we use them wisely, and that we get that balance right so they are sustainable for South Africans. South Africa has got 58 million people here. Ethiopia, which is the size of Limpopo, has got over 100 million people. More than, it's actually more than double. Imagine more than double the amount of people in the whole country living in Limpopo. You understand? These things are serious. So what does it entail? We go from the vision for the resource. What do we want to do? We want it to be used or protection. We, we, so in some cases, we must allocate resource for use. Remember, we must allocate resources for development. We must allocate resources for protection. Remember the list of, of, of requirements we have for resources, according to the National Water Act. Then we classify the resources. That's the second bubble now. So we classify them. When you classify them, you decide on a class. Is the classification going to be a class 1, a class 2, or a class 3? We only have three choices, guys. Makes it a little bit easier. Class 1, <coughs> class 2, class 3. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But in order to establish the class, we need to decide, is there a requirement for users? Are there people, and is there a requirement in terms of the socioeconomic well-being of the country? Do people want to use the resource? And or... Do we have a requirement to protect the resource? Okay, and remember, one part of the act requires that we establish the reserve for each resource. The reserve is the, the amount of water that everybody requires for their basic human needs and the amount of water needed to keep the system functioning. Okay, so we have the vision first. We can determine the reserve. And the reserve will give us the ecological requirements. If we have the requirements of the ecosystem and we have the requirements of the users, we can talk about the balance. We can talk about the trade-off between use and protection. Okay? And when we consider the trade-off with management and scientists and society together, we decide on classes. Are we going to have a class one, class two, or class three? Class one is high protection. Class 2 is a balance between protection and use, and Class 3 is high use. So we must decide which parts of our water management area we're going to allocate for, for use. Then we decide which parts of the management area we're going to allocate for protection. You understand that? We've got to decide the trade-offs to get that balance of sustainability right. How do we, once we've decided what the class is, we need to go and determine how do we actually achieve the class? How do we achieve a Class 1? or a class two, or a class three. And that is where the, 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 the methodology for resource quality objectives comes in. Okay, and that's what this presentation is about. It's about RQOs. So the act requires that we come up with a vision for the resource. The act requires that we establish a reserve. The act requires that we classify the resources. The act requires that we set RQOs. Those are those four puzzle pieces that we looked at yesterday, the four puzzle pieces. And the RQOs are the specific objectives within a particular area, so they can, be, they can be allocated to a particular river, or they can be allocated to a particular wetland, or a particular estuary, or a piece of river, or an area, okay, the RQOs. So the RQOs are applicable on different spatial scales. So it can be one site, or it can be a small area, or it can be for a whole region, 
or it can be for a group of systems. Do you understand that? The RQOs can be applicable for different spatial scales. But those RQOs are the specific targets or objectives that you require for the quantity, the flows of water, the quality of water, the habitat for the resource, and the biota. So we can set a whole range of, of new laws. Hey? The Water Act requires that RQOs are set, so they're going to become laws. And those, those new laws can be set for flows, for water quality, for habitat, for biota. Why? To achieve the class. And if you achieve the class, you achieve the balance between use and protection, the trade-off. And if you achieve the balance, you're going to achieve your vision. And if you achieve your vision, we achieve sustainability. Okay, I'm going to keep going backwards and forwards to show you how it works. So the RQOs, that's what we want to achieve. Once the RQOs are set, and they are gazetted by the minister, they become law, and now they can be implemented. Now you use these, object, these RQOs, which are the legal objectives for different parts of the resource, to make sure that we achieve a particular condition of the quality of flows, the, qu the quantity of, of, of water and the resource, the quality of the water resource, which is the water quality, the habitat of the resource, and the biota. Okay, so they come from specific laws. And if we implement them, we implement them through two things. We can implement them through source-directed controls, the ecological requirements to say, this must be done. You must do this thing. You must protect this thing. And um, uh, user requirements through source-directed controls, which is, well, telling a user, this is your water license. This is what you can do. You may not do anything more than this. Okay. So that process from going from the vision, which everybody's involved with, gets broken down into an objective for a particular area, and in order to achieve the objective, the provincial government can write a requirement, a license, and say, guys, this is your license. You have to achieve this on your license. You may not release more than this. You have to ensure that in relation to what you're doing, that you are managed according to this, so we can achieve the objective. Okay, that's how it works. And who does that? The provincial office of the Department of Water and Sanitation, or in our case, the Unkumati Usutu Catchment Management Agency. Okay, so what I want to do for you guys is I'm going to ask the IUCMA when they have the next forum meeting, when they discuss this, they're going to have it here at UMP. So you guys can come and see what they do. And you guys can ask them questions. But what about this? How are you protecting? Do you have RQOs to protect the resource? Where are those RQOs? Are you doing it? When they tell you that we are failing, 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 you can say, but if you're failing with all these RQOs, that means you're not going to achieve sustainability. What are you doing about that? You understand? It's time that more people started putting them to the test. All right. So I'm hoping that for one of our one day during this next term, I'm going to ask the IUCMA when they have a forum meeting, please to come here. And then I'm going to invite all of you to a hall like this, and we're going to have other stakeholders from industry and other managers, and then the people are going to present, and they're going to show you the data. And then you can go, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what the law says. Okay, I want to show you that this is real. There's another lady here who's involved with trying to get these things implemented, trying to get these activities and processes going. Her name is Dr. Sharon Pollard. She runs an organization called The Ward. And she wants interns. And I'm going to ask her to come as well so she can show you how do we take this information and do it. How is it being done? Okay. Cool. So, back to water resource classification. So we're over here now, hey? We're over here. Between here, we've got to classify the resource and we've got to decide what is the management class for each resource. Too quickly. So management classes are attributes that the Department of Water and Sanitation, remember DWA is always referred to, now is referred to as DWS, and society require for different water resources. The process requires a wide range of trade-offs to be evaluated at a number of scales. That is spatial scales, local scale, Regional scale. Regional scale, 
How much water do we have in the whole area? Okay? If we send this water and we make these dams, we'll be okay. Maybe we can still give some water back to the Olifants River. Interbasin transfer. Do you understand? Different scales. Or on a local scale, remember we spoke about what is the biggest thing that contributes towards impacts in South Africa? Is it mining? What is it? It's what? It's people. It's sewage. And the wastewater treatment works. Look, it can change in some areas, but we know that we have a big issue here. Here we want to make sure that this sewage plant, this activity, is big enough to cater for what we are sending to it. And that as well can be included in some of these decisions, these trade-offs. Um, final outcome of the process is a set of de desired characteristics for the use and ecological condition for each water resource. During this classification process, what we do is we actually determine what, what are we going to try and allocate for use? What can be used? And what must be protected? See, specifically, what can be used and what must be protected? The next thing is to come up with a class. A class one, a class two, and a class three. Class one is when we use resources minimally. Class two is when we've got this moderate use. Remember the balance between use and protection. And class three is when we use it heavily. Okay? For class one, most of the ecological categories are a B or better. For a class two, most of the ecological categories will be a C or better. And for class three, most of the ecological categories will be in a class D. Now, what do I mean by class B, C, and D? Have I shown you yet that, guys, we use a classification system from A to F to classify the state of our resources. A to F. A refers to a pristine natural ecosystem. No human impact or human activity whatsoever. Do you understand? People have not been able to impact that ecosystem. Okay? What do you think if I told you that's an A? F is it's completely transformed. F is there's no more river, it's now a canal, and there's no life in it. The water quality is so bad, nothing can live in it. In fact, if you go and use that resource, you'll probably get sick. That's an F. A to an F. Okay. So you know the resource that we can classify between an A and an F. What do you think the condition, according to A to F, what is the condition of most of the rivers in the Kruger National Park? The Kruger National Park. Hey, okay. Let's start. Who thinks that it's an F? Put your hand up. Kruger National Park, eh? No people. What is the conditions of the river in the Kruger National Park? F, no takers. E, no takers. D, no takers. One. C, B, A. Who thinks that the rivers in the Kruger National Park are in an A category? Please put up your hands, guys. Let's try this again. Who thinks it's in an A? A. A. Class A, pristine. No one. Class B, largely natural. Few modifications, but still quite intact and natural. One, two, three, four, five. About ten. C is moderately modified. Some developments, but not too bad. C. Another couple. Ten, twenty. Class D. Class D is largely modified. There are big impacts, but it's still sustainable. We've lost most of our biota, but it's still okay. One, two, three, four, five-ish. E's, anybody with an E? That means it's already highly contaminated. And an F, buggered, completely buggered. All right, so most of you didn't vote. <laughs> but... Um, in, in the Kruger National Park, all the water that comes into the Kruger Park, like the Crocodile River, the Crocodile River goes from Mambela, with all of the wastewater treatment works, where does it go? Into the Kruger Park. The Olifants River goes through all of these mines and all of these activities, and it goes into the, the Kruger Park. If you look at the Sabi River, the Sabi River doesn't have much development upstream, and it goes into the Kruger Park from upstream. Okay? The Olifants River has got mines, agriculture. In fact, the river is dry. And where should that water flow into? Into the Kruger Park. You see, so the Kruger Park's rivers 
are actually, on average, not in a very good condition. They're about C, C, D category. Okay? One of our most premier important conservation areas where we're trying to protect this high endemic diversity of aquatic organisms. The rivers are in a C and a D state. Why? Because it's located downstream of all the other activities. Do you remember I showed you that picture of all the wildebeest that were dying in, in Mara? Hey? Did I show you the picture? No. Okay, I'm going to get to that just now. I want to show you this picture. All right, let's move on. So we've got these, class of, these categories, class one, class two, class three. Okay, this is the Ulefans River catchment, guys. The Ulefans River catchment goes from Imalakleni all the way <coughs> downstream into the Kruger National Park. All the way from Imalakleni all the way downstream to the Kruger National Park. Can you see here, this map shows us what part of the catchment has been split up into these different areas for management. They call them management areas, eh? IUAs, Integrated Units of Analysis. They've selected 12 different areas. So you break the whole catchment up into 12 areas and say, because that type of activity here is similar, or the protection importance here is similar, we're going to give you a class for each one, class one, two, or three. And then we decide, let's start at the top by Emalakhleni. Class one, class two, or class three. All the users say, class three, class three. We need to use it. We've got mines, we've got power stations, we've got urban areas, we've got pollution. You need to make it a class three. If you make it a class one, high protection focus, none of us can work here. We all have to leave. Okay, please, it must be a class three. And you go through the process and you decide, okay, if the upper part of the Imalakhleni area is a class three, what about the part next to it, the Volcher? This is number two here is the Volcher. See, class three, make it a class three. And we say, no, you cannot have everything a class three because we will not achieve sustainability. Okay, some of the conservationists are saying, class one, class one, make it a class one. We want to protect the Volcher because the upper crocodile is contaminated. If they fix the upper crocodile, the upper olifant, sorry, if they fix the upper olifants one day, all of the boats that are currently lives in the Volcher can go back into the upper olifants and we can get re-establishment. We can improve again. Make it a class one. And then we say, no, if we make it a class one, that means Kusile Power Station cannot be there. Kusile Power Station. In fact, Kusile, Kusile is based about here. Uh, no, it's lower down, about there. Okay, make it a class three, they, the, the users say. No, no. We'll make it a class two. Ah, oh, what does that mean? That means that we have to, all the mines in the bulk catchment have to improve the way they are managing their resource. No more coal mines in the, in the, the, the bulk catchment. And then people are saying, but I've got businesses here. No, if we use everything, we are going to destroy everything, we're going to have nothing left. Finish using what you need in, in resource unit one, in the IUA one, and we will try to rehabilitate it, and then you can look at the book. You understand? Leave it for the future. But we want the money now. No. You understand? That's what happens. Then we say, okay, what about number three, which is downstream of the olifants, a, a downstream of unit one and two, and then we say, okay, you can give that a class three. It can be a class three. But then they say, what about four? Oh, no, four must be a class three as well. We want everything to be a class three. We say, that's not possible. You cannot achieve this balance if everything is a class three. So what's going to be more important? Corvus Dow, Marble Hall area is a class three, or resource unit one around Moscow Dam. Which one must be a class two? And they have this trade-off. And they say, okay, okay, okay. Corvus Dow, Marble Hall, you know, class, um, the Airlines River catchment, we will make class three, and then we will allocate the lower part of the Olifants River as a class two. Class two now. So this resource unit number three, which has been allocated with a class two, that is the, the hardest, that is one of the hardest places in the world, guys. That is one of the hardest places in the world to achieve the water use license requirements of the users. 
one of the hardest places in the world. Why? Because the amount of money being generated from that area, because of the mining and all the other developments and water quality coming from upstream, is very high. But the cost to treat and improve the quality of the resource is also very, very high. But the protection value is also very high. So that is an area where people want to get away. The Guptas, they want to leave there. Get out of that resource unit number three. Where are they going to go? They're going to go to resource unit number one, or IUA number one. Integrated unit of analysis, this area number one. Okay, because there the classes are three. Then the people are saying, it's not fair, it's not fair. The mine activity upstream has got this license for 500 milligrams per liter of sulfate. We have to achieve 200. It's impossible. But we say, guys, if you do not protect some of these areas, all of it is going to be lost. Okay, in this area, the quality of the fish must be suitable for, humans, people, to, for people to eat. In this area, we must protect the diversity of different species. In this area, we must protect the quality and the, and the amount of water that is being used for wetlands. Do you understand? We have to get the balance right. And we go through that process. Can you see in the Audifines River catchment, the whole catchment, there is only one small area that's been allocated at class one. In the whole area, the whole water management area, only IUA number 13, the Blyder River, has been given a high protection focus. The Blyder River. Crazy, eh? But we have to start somewhere, guys. So this is not ideal. This is not ideal, but we do need to start somewhere. And the idea is that if we can take this for the next 10 or 20 years, we can, come, we can improve it back from where it has been. Okay, why is that important to us? Look here. Jumping ahead a little bit. Because this is the present ecological state of all of the resources in the Audifrance River, the present ecological state. Can you see that these yellows, the yellow and the red, is totally unacceptable. The yellow and the red. And you can see in the upper Olifants River area, in IUA number one, you've got a lot of yellow. You see, these are areas where it is already in unsustainable, highly degraded state. And as you go down the catchment, you can see there are lots of areas that are highly degraded. Okay, these yellows and these reds, highly, highly degraded. The D, most of the catchment is on that point where it's just surviving, the D. Okay, there's a lot of work to do. And we think that if we start, if we at least start with the current classification system and we try to get there over the next 20 years, we will be in a better place. So what do we do is we take this map and we want to achieve this map, okay? So it's the same colors, okay? The colors are the same. There's just A, B, and B, Cs. There's intermediate colors. But what we want to do is we want to improve from this map with too much D and too much yellow and red. And we want to achieve this. And you can see this map shows us that we are not allowed to have any EFs. According to the law, we are not allowed to plan for any EFs. This is what we want. This is the step one. But the conservation people are saying to us, how can you accept that the Kruger National Park is going to be in a class C? How? It is the Kruger Park. It should be in an A. And we say it is impossible to achieve an A. For the next 10 or 20 years, we will start with this. Okay, now we know in the upper parts of the catchment, look at all those dark green colors where the icon is at the moment. All of those dark green colors show us that we want to achieve, oopsie, here, we want to achieve at least a D. Some improvement to a C, but at least a D. If you move across to the Volcher, you can see these lighter colors with some blue. That must have a higher protection. So when we've done the classification, guys, we now know what must be achieved in these small areas. And where are we today? We are here. Can you see? It's the same scale. Can you see? There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done, especially around this marble hall area. If you look at this area over here, look at the change from E, Fs, and Ds, and trying to get it back to Ds and Cs. Okay. 
There's a lot of work. People have got to stop the way that you were using resources. Do you remember from the SDG, SDG video? Can they be achieved? Yes, but not with business as usual. Do you remember that? Not if we keep doing it the way we were doing it. We have to change the way we were doing it. We have to start looking towards getting that sustainable balance right. You cannot just abuse and use resources. You have to use them, but you use them in a safe way. Do you know, guys, when you look at irrigation, for example, which is a big area around this marble hall area, they just irrigate in the hottest days in the middle of the day, and there's not enough water. The farmers have to change the way they're irrigating. They have to start using drip irrigation. They have to start using better technology. Okay. It's very important. Do you have any questions? Okay. So these are the classes, and this is our plan. So where are we in the, in the, in the guideline? We have here, hey? We've moved from knowing what we, how we're going to classify the resources, what we need. We've now established our classes. The next step, once we've got the classes, is to try and set those objectives, those targets, to achieve them. Why do we call them objectives? Why are they called objectives? Because it's something we are working towards. If you said it is a requirement, resource requirements, they must be achieving it already. And we know that is impossible. We have to give people time. We have to give them time to improve the way that they are using the resource. So, what are RQOs? I don't know why it's jumping around like this. RQOs must be simple. We call it requisite simplicity. As simple as is necessary. Is this, is this, this these lectures, guys, are these lectures simple? Do you know this presentation? Can you see the way it was laid out? Did you see that one of my colleagues, Boitimelo, she's one of the colleagues. I was one of the project managers on this project. Boitimelo was the, the uh, Department of Water and Sanitation manager who was working with me. And she gave this presentation. Do you know who she gave this presentation to? Farmers. Farmers. People from mines. People from urban areas. They're not even studying this. You guys are studying this. It, it's supposed to be as simple as possible. But sometimes, we cannot make it simpler than this. You understand that? I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. I hope that you guys are learning a little bit. University is a tough journey, ladies and gentlemen. It's a tough journey. Do you know why? How's this for a crazy one? How's this? Of all of you, maybe 10 of you are going to use this for the rest of your life. But we need to give it to you because of those 10 people. Do you understand that? <laughs> How many of you guys are going to do zoology? 10. But we need to give all of you the zoology for those 10 people. How many of you guys are going to go into resource management? 10 of you. But I need to give the whole thing to you for those 10. Do you understand? So that you guys, all of you, have got choices. This is all about choices. Okay? Cool. So they've got to be simple. They've got to be easy. You've got to be able to measure them. Guys, if you guys decide to go and do this work, I told you, there are no catchment management agencies in the rest of the country. If you go to the department and say, you know what? I can see all of your job adverts. I want a job advert. I want to go and be a, uh, an official working in a provincial office because I know resource quality objectives. I had that at university. It's on my CV. They will say, great, come. Can you please go and measure the objectives? And you can say, OK, I just need to read up. I need to go back to my notes from university. Yes, I can. Is it quantity, quality, habitat, or biota? They will fall over. They will fall over in their chairs. I'm telling you, if the IUCMA people come here and you say to them, what is the class? Is it a class one, a class two, or a class three? They'll say, oh, sorry, this is a class two. Do you have RQOs? Yes, we do. Do you have RQOs for quality and quantity in biota? Yes, but we don't have any for biota. You can say, why? Is the biota not important here? I'm telling you, those people from the government will fall over in their chairs. And they will think we are doing a fantastic job. 
So the difficulty is how to take this information and get it into your heads. Do you know that? That's my job as a lecturer, is to take the information I have because I'm one person and I don't even want to do this. Do you know that? I don't want to do this. Huh? I don't want to be the scientist who does this again and again and again. I've done it a few times. I don't like it. It's up to you guys to go and do it. You guys just go and get the paychecks. Huh? Up to you guys. Okay. They must be understood and applied. You've got to make sure that it makes sense. All right, we're almost finished. There need to be as few as necessary. I think we will stop here, actually. I don't want to go too far into this. All right, any chance for any last questions about RQOs?